This morning, I want to talk about the unshakable life, the unshakable life that is only possible for those that have built their life upon the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. We continue our series through the book of Hebrews as we look at Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 18. Is it possible with all of the realities of life and when our lives are shaken, is it possible that in a world that is constantly in flux, to actually have an unshakable life. There's many themes that we've heard about in Hebrews, but I pray that you are recognizing that the one constant theme is the theme of holding fast, written, originally a sermon, but written as an epistle to Jewish Christians facing persecution, facing sufferings, facing the temptation to turn away from this Christ, they are being reminded over and over again, hold fast, do not let go, do not walk away, because Christ is better, Christ is greater. Over and over again, we see that theme, that there is an anchor in this, un in this shakeable, uncertain life. In verses 18 through 29 this morning, some scholars have called this the tale of two mountains. For it is the two mountains that is one of the many themes throughout the Bible. And you'll see two mountains starkly contrasted to one another. And for the sake of this sermon, I would like to refer to mountain one as the mountain of self-confidence, while mountain two is the mountain of Christ-centered confidence. You'll see this theme often throughout the Bible, not only the tale of two mountains, but the tale of two cities, the tale of two kingdoms from Gen Genesis to Revelation. You'll see the comparing and contrasting the city of God to the city of man, the kingdom of God to the kingdom of this world. In fact, I'd like to recommend to you uh, a book called The City of God and the Goal of Creation by T. Desmond Alexander, who does a masterful job, published by Crossway, of explaining one of these many themes throughout the scriptures. But let's look together at this tale of two mountains and how we can be grounded in this unshakable life, a kingdom that cannot be shaken for you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I will tremble with fear but you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than Abel, than the blood of Abel, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is things that have been made in order that things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for, for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord, it stands forever. Amen. The late night comic and television host, David Letterman, upon his retirement said this, every night you're trying to prove your self-worth. It's like meeting your girlfriend's family for the first time. 
You want to be the absolute best, wittiest, smartest, most charming, best smelling version of yourself. If I can make people enjoy the experience and have a higher regard for me when I'm finished, it makes me feel like an entire person. But if I've come short of that, I'm not happy. In fact, I'm devastated. How things go for me every night is how I feel about myself for the next 24 hours because I'm not playing a character. I'm trying to give you the best version of myself. What an incredibly heavy burden to carry. But I wanna ask you in light of that illustration, for you, where is your confidence this morning? Is it in your self performance? Is it in your human approval? Is it in how you perform before others and giving this world the best version of you? Or is it truly in the Christ who has performed perfectly on your behalf? I wanna ask you this question, which mountain truly defines your life? The mountain of self-confidence or the mountain of Christ-centered confidence? Which mountain are you running to in order to find the security, stability, and hope that your soul ultimately longs for? I first want us to look at that first mountain. This is the shakable life. The shakable life as it's described by the author of Hebrews in verses 18 through 22. This mountain of self-confidence is actually a literal mountain. He's describing the experience of the Israelites on Mount Sinai. Verses 18 through 21 is taking us back to Exodus chapter 19 where the people of God under the leadership of Moses prepared themselves for three days and they came to the Mount Sinai to receive the law. But what he's describing here is what they encountered. And the author of Hebrews uses seven words or phrases to describe this experience. And it's nothing but gloom and fear and trembling, and ultimately rejection. You see, it's important for us to understand in verses 18 and 22, this idea of coming to a mountain is not describing a move from one geographical position to another geographical position. The idea of coming to the mountain, as they did in Exodus 19, is our approach to life and God. Not a geographical move from one location to the next, but how we approach life in God. And so the author of Hebrews is saying in verse 18, you Christians, we have not approached life in God as if we are going to Mount Sinai in order to achieve on our own what only God can achieve for us. What he's saying in verse 18 is so profound. He's saying you are acting at times as if you approach life and God with a self-righteousness and a self-confidence, a cavalier flippant attitude as if you can achieve this on your own. And he said, no, quite the contrary. You've approached the other mountain that we'll get to in a second in verse 22. You approach life and God in a whole different way than those that operate with a self-confidence and a self-righteousness because he's warning us in verse 18 through 21, those that approach life with a self-confidence and a self-righteousness in their performance, you will be shaken. The word shaken here is synonymous with judgment. You see, the only thing Mount Sinai has to offer without a mediator, the only thing Mount Sinai, that first mountain, has to offer without Jesus Christ is judgment. You see, if we approach God and life as if we don't need him, as if we can do this on our own, with a self-confidence and a self-righteousness, you will only be disappointed. In fact, it says you'll be devastated. You see, the reason why this can only result in fear, as it says in verses 18 through 21, is that Mount Sinai tells you, you will never measure up. You will never be good enough. 
Because at Mount Sinai, Moses and the people of God were confronted with the absolute righteousness and holiness of God in light of their unrighteousness and their imperfection. And so if you dare try to approach this life apart from God, building a life that relies on your own strength and your own power, a life that centers its confidence upon you, you can only expect the same result. A life that when the world is shaken, that you will be shaken by it. If your confidence in your hope is in anything but Jesus Christ, when this world is shaken, you will be shaken by it. And we would do ourselves a so much good and do our children and our grandchildren so much favor and good if we would teach them early on that a life founded and centered around you, a life centered around your own confidence and strength and power will only result in misery. The result of self-confidence is only a life of fear, bitterness, doubt, and defeat because we realize that we'll never be able to ultimately measure up It tells us in verse 19 that there's a word speaking to them. And it says eventually in verse 19, they basically tell the mountain, stop. I can't handle it anymore because it is the voice of judgment and condemnation that is the only word that is given to those that think that they can live this life apart from God and live a life centered around their confidence, their strength, and their power, you will ultimately be confronted with the sobering reality of the judgment and condemnation of God. If you try to live your life apart from him, it is a life that is shakable, living your life before the mountain of self-confidence. But thanks be to God that the author of Hebrews does not only give us a sobering picture of what the shakable life looks like, a life built on your own confidence and strength, but moving on in verses 22, he gives us what it looks like to approach life and God in such a way that results in an unshakable life that regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what life throws your way, regardless of what you experience in life, you can live with the absolute promise that your life will be unshakable. And this mountain in verse 22 is the mountain of Zion. Now the mountain of Zion was the highest place outside of Jerusalem. Eventually it had encompassed the what is known as the Temple Mount. But throughout scripture, it is also symbolic of the heavenly city. It is symbolic of the heavenly city that awaits all those that have been saved in Jesus Christ, the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God, the spiritual Mount Zion, and that's what the author of Hebrews is referring to here. He's taking us to the end of history, and he's saying this is the city we seek not a city built by man, not a city grounded by man's confidence and centered upon his confidence, but we seek and go to a city that is centered and founded on God, centered on the confidence of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. But do you notice what he says in verse 22 that is absolutely profound? He says in verse 22, yes, you haven't come to the first mountain, the mountain that can only result in fear, but he says in the past tense, did you catch that? In verse 22, he says, you have come. Wait a second, I thought pastor, you just told us Mount Zion is the heavenly city that awaits those at the end of history, at the consummation of the kingdom. But the author of Hebrews says, you've already come past tense. And that's the glorious truth for the Christian. The glorious truth for the Christian is that we have the privilege to already experience, not in perfection, but to genuinely experience the blessings of the heavenly city right now. That's the living in the already but not yet. That's what it means to not live of this world, but simply live in this world, that our citizenship is ultimately in heaven. The author of Hebrews is saying, stop living as those that have not already experienced 
heavenly Zion. You are citizens of a different city. You are citizens of a kingdom that does not find their confidence in man, but finds their confidence in Christ. Start acting like it. You can experience heaven now and manifest it with other believers. The city of God right here and now. This is what it means to be a part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. This is what it means to have an unshakable life. This is what it means to approach God and life not as if we are trying to climb up the mountain all by ourselves. But we've already come to a mountain where God climbs down the mountain for us and offers us himself. It says the very living presence of God and the living city of God, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are the people that are seeking the city that is to come. Do you understand the implications of this? The application for this as the people of God living in a shakable world, a world and a life of uncertainty, it means you have a secured future. You already can live out your future now. The author of Hebrews is telling us you don't have to worry about the future because in Jesus Christ you can experience a foretaste of heaven on earth. You know what we fear the most? We fear tomorrow because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. And so many of us right now are full of fear and anxiety, not knowing what will my health look like tomorrow? What will my life look like tomorrow? What will my finances look like tomorrow? Will I be relevant? Will I go the distance? Will I make it? And the author of Hebrews says, stop. You already know the future. Your greatest fear in life and death, your future is forever secured and you can live out the realities now. What a beautiful promise and application for the people of God. But not only do you have a secured future, but you have unspeakable joy. Look what it says for those that have already come to the Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. In verse 22, and you've come into the presence of innumerable angels in the festal gathering. That phrase festal gathering was only reserved for a gathering, a a gathering where the celebration was euphoric. It was actually reserved for the, the Olympic gatherings in Athens. When the, when the peoples from all over the region would gather, they would throw this incredible party, this incredible celebration, and the author of Hebrews is saying, this is what it's gonna be like. And thank God. Sometimes we give the impression as the church and as the people of God, like heaven is going to be boring. And the author of Hebrews says, it's going to be a wild party beyond your imagination. The only word he can come up with is a festal gathering in a joyless world. You can have unspeakable joy, not at the end, but the author of Hebrews says you can have unspeakable joy now. This is the unshakable life. You see, the problem is we spend all of our time and energy and money seeking after the things that can only be promised at Mount Zion, and we will do everything possible by our own confidence and according to our own strength and power to secure our future and to secure our stability and to secure our lives and to secure our joy to no avail. And the author of Hebrews says that all the things you long for, all the things your soul craves, only found for those that seek the city, the unshakable life. This is the gospel. This is the good news for you. You know what's remarkable at this passage? In the midst of all of this joy and all this festal gathering, it says in verse 23, that sitting on the mountain, the mountain of Zion, the the mountain that's full of joy, it says the judge is there. I don't know about you, I don't want a judge there. Everything I know about the judge, is the judge ruins the party, right? The judge is there to condemn, the the judge is there to, 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 to judge me. How can the judge be in the midst of the party? 
That's the good news. You see, for those that know Jesus Christ, for those that have been saved by his grace, the judge becomes a father. Because in the person of Jesus Christ, on the cross, he took on our condemnation. He took on the very judgment and the wrath of God. And it is only found in Christianity, this truth, that the judge came down to be judged so that you and I could forever live with the glorious truth that we are set apart by grace according to his glory and for his glory forever. The judge in Jesus becomes your father only in Christianity and only the gospel of Jesus Christ gives you that hope. You know, in verse 25, there's a rather sobering warning It says, see to that, you don't refuse. You don't refuse the one who is speaking. Remember I said in this passage, there's two voices. There's a voice we're told in verse 19 coming off the Mount Sinai. That voice was only able to be a voice of condemnation and judgment. But there's another voice we're told in verse 24 It's the voice coming from Mount Zion that does not offer a word of condemnation and judgment, but instead it actually speaks a better word. It is the words of the blood of Jesus, a blood that speaks a better word even than Abel. Remember, Abel in Genesis was only able to speak a word of vengeance, but the blood of Jesus says, I've taken the vengeance of God so that you could forever have the word of grace spoken upon your life. But the author of Hebrews says, don't mess around with this. Do not refuse this word. It is a far better word. And who in the world would refuse this word that's coming from Mount Zion? And so if you are here this morning or listening in at home, Would you heed the words and the exhortation from the author of Hebrews? Do not refuse this word because there you cannot get this word in anything else and from anywhere else and from no one else except for Jesus Christ that is the word that is spoken to you this morning. To come, to come to the mountain, the mountain of Mount Zion and experience the grace of the judge who came down to be judged for you, do not reject the eloquent word of the blood of Jesus. How can you refuse such a great salvation? My eight-year-old daughter, Lydia, loves to dance. She often turns walking into dancing. If you've ever seen her here at the church or You've been to our home. I mean, we could be in the national park and she will just be dancing right along through the park. But anytime she dances, she demands an audience. It's a big ordeal. And she's quite a good dancer. I mean, she gets her dancing moves after her father, of course. (laughs) And as she's dancing and demands an audience, it could be in the middle of the day, it could be at night, it doesn't matter what the time, it doesn't matter what we're doing. I could be working on a sermon, we could be working on the house, everybody needs to stop and watch Lydia dance. But the look on her face when we stop and we pause and we give her the attention and the favor, the look on her face and the joy that is expressed It's only something a father and a mother could truly appreciate. Listen to me. If you are in Christ this morning, you no longer have to jump up and down. You no longer have to fight for the approval of this world. You no longer have to approach life and God based on your performance and your confidence, jumping up and down, waving all around in order to get the affection and the approval that you already have in Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus this morning, you've already come. 
rest in that glorious truth. If you know Jesus Christ and have been saved by his grace, live as if you already have and are experiencing the affection and favor of your father. But if you haven't come, would you come? No longer have to fight, no longer having to strive, no longer having to say that my life will be built upon my confidence and my strength and my performance, but I can accept the one who performed for me, who changes my life forever, that allows me to say, as the author of Hebrews said, how can we reject such a great salvation and instead respond with joy and awe and reverence? to this God who came down for me in the midst of an uncertain life in a shakable world. We can be the people of God who can say, I've already come, already come to Mount Zion and my life, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the situation, I can say that my life is unshakable. Don't run back to that mountain that can only offer condemnation, but continue to run to the mountain, the mountain of joy, the mountain who turns the judge into your father.